Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Hallelujah. I'm glad that you can yes. join Alice and I for this time together in God's wonderful Word. Precious Word. Precious Word. Precious Word. Hallelujah. Yes. yes. Um, we're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter to the Romans. The Romans. This is our 36th chapter of this study as we go line by line. Oftentimes, word by word, because well, we want to dig in and, and get the treasures out yes. of the Word of God. And there's so much. And there is so much treasure. So many gems. Um, we we started last our last session in uh, Romans chapter 14, and did verses one through three. So, and in this session today, we'll be starting and picking up in Romans 14:4. So, if you get your Bibles, if you have. Uh, and it's a good idea to have paper and pen or pencil so you can take notes. notes. Yes. And do as I and I always want to remind you this to test the things I say against the Word of God. Uh, I I recognize the fact that I am not infallible. Amen to that. Uh, all I know is that I have a heart willing to serve the Lord, and this is what He the way He has called me to serve Him. So and I I appreciate that. I I pray that today that. The Spirit of God will give me something to impart that will bless you and touch your life uh, and, and bring you closer and closer to the Lord. And you can go back and revisit these Bible studies. Absolutely. Every one of the studies. You'll get, you'll get yeah. new understanding every time you go yeah. into them. And, and every one of these studies is available on our Bible Talk website, mm -hmm. www.bibletalk.com. Uh, so you can go back and revisit them. You can invite others. If you're blessed by these, we'd appreciate it if you tell Pass others it about it. Yes. Pass it on, yeah. Uh, so before we start, and I, I want to get started here, yes. let me first of all do this. Father, thank you, we Jesus. just thank you for the leading of your Spirit, mm. the Spirit that you sent to bring us, to lead us into all truth. Oh, because your Son, Jesus, is the truth. Yes. And our desire here is to see your Son, Jesus, more clearly. Amen. So that we might be more and more like him. That we would have that encouragement of scriptures to bring us to that place where we are more and more partakers of your divine nature, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just pray that you open the eyes of our hearts that we would indeed see wonderful things in your word. Lord, that we would have greater and greater understanding of what you have revealed through your faithful servants like the Apostle Paul. That we might grow in our walk with you. Yes, Lord. So we just pray this, Father, in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, knowing that this is a prayer in your will and that we can, we can be assured that that's your purpose in our lives. Right. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Let's get to it. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 14. I'm going to start in verse 4. And, and let me just kind of just bring you back very quickly and just recap. This is a chapter talking about, you know, how we are to deal with others who's whose quote-unquote faith doesn't line up and match ours perfectly, right. Right? right? Although ours is not the standard by which it's no, judged. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. but, but the fact is that we, we have different beliefs about different things. But when I talked about this, and I explained this a lot in our last session, mm -hmm. we are not talking about the foundations of our faith. We, this is talking about how we believers, those who have accepted the atoning work of Jesus Christ, that gift of the Father, that did for us what we could never do for ourselves. That That is the foundational truth that we share. Right. And there is no question about that. It's in the minor details, you know, and there's an expression in the world, the devil is in the details, details. Right. That, that tend to divide us and separate us. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. And you have to remember that in Rome, this is now a predominantly Gentile group of believers. Mm -hmm that was certainly started by believers who had come out of Israel, out of, uh, out of Jerusalem, and you know, to, to bring this wonderful word. But just as a little historical point of fact, which is something we've covered before, is that the Emperor Claudius, prior to this time that Paul is writing his letter, had, had evicted, kicked all of the Jews, right. believers in Christ and, and not, had evicted them all from the city of Rome. Now they're coming back in, but at one point in time, the church in Rome was strictly a church of the Gentiles mm. because the Jews had been kicked yeah. out. Yeah. And, the, and the fact is, as, is obvious in 
from the book of Acts, for example, you can see that a lot of the Jewish believers in Christ were still holding fast to traditions and laws. Mm. Something that Paul deals with in virtually every letter that he wrote. Right. All right? So those differences have to somehow be reconciled so that we can have unity and all have one mind, right. be in one accord, right? Because that's God's purpose. And if you don't believe it's purpose, here's a little homework for you. Go read that last prayer of Jesus Christ in the garden in John chapter 17 and see how important our unity is. And Paul is trying to ensure that we have that unity in Christ. Okay? Romans 14, 4. Thank you, Lord. Paul says, Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. You know, I'm, I'm just reminded of the, of the verse where it says that what God has begun, he is able to complete. You know, he's going to, he's going to do this work. He's the potter and we're the clay. Right. He is the one that's molding us and shaping us. But he uses his word to do that. Yes. Because his word is there, as Paul says to Timothy, to train us in righteousness, to reprove us, to correct us. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to, first of all, remind you that at the beginning of this letter to the Romans, Paul introduces himself in the first line of this letter as a bond servant of Christ Jesus. And then later in Acts 27, on the stormy seas of life as he's being transported as a prisoner to Rome, mm -hmm. and that incredible storm rises up in Acts 27, Paul said that he had been visited by, and this is a quote, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Mm. So Paul knew who he served. He knew. Paul knew to whom he belonged. All right? He knew who he was. And he had that assurance in his own life. We have to come to that place of knowing who we are in Christ That's right. That's right. and our relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I distract myself, but I'm just, it just popped into my mind. I'm thinking about um, Zacharias who went into with John the Baptist's father, who was the priest who went into the temple. And he, and he was in, he had this encounter with the angel Gabriel. Oh, my goodness gracious. Stands in the presence of And God. Gabriel tells him, you know, your, your wife Elizabeth is going to have a son, and here's his ministry. And Zacharias Zach, has doubt, you know. He's old. His wife is barren. How can this be? And Gabriel says, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. Oh, my mm -hmm. goodness gracious. What an incredible statement to know who you are and where you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul had that blessed assurance in his life, right? You need to come to have that. I need to have that. We all do. And it can be. So, so like Paul, you have to know who you belong to mm -hmm. and who you serve mm -hmm. in order to truly understand that others report to God and not to you. If you don't understand your relationship with God, you will certainly never understand other people's relationship with God. And that's what Paul is saying here. And for, you know, how, how do you judge a servant of another? All right? um, I was just wondering if um, cause this came to mind when I read that verse. The parable that Jesus spoke about when he, the um, man went out to hire workers for the field. Hmm. And he hired one at nine o'clock, and then and five, and five at the end of the day. And at yeah. the end of the day, that that person got the same amount of pay as the the first yeah. one. So I mean, is that referencing? Well, with, or it, some in, in a sense, it is because that? well, it is because it says that, that that God is no respecter of men, right? And how He chooses to deal with one is His business, right. not ours, right? So, and that is kind of what Jesus was saying in that in that parable. You know, if this is the way God wants to deal with that person. That's, that's between God and Him. That's right. Not that's between not between you. you. And it's not between you and God, and it's not between you and that other person. That's right. That's right. All right. So we need to get clarity on this. Mm -hmm. We need to have clear understanding. Otherwise, it becomes a block to our division. unity, yeah. and it becomes division. That's absolutely true. That's right. You see, one of the great dangers here is that we have a natural tendency to judge others mm -hmm. by our own traditions, our own practices, and our own culture rather than testing all things by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, interestingly, if you, if you want to see this, and there's many examples of it, but I think one of the great examples of this is in John chapter 9, mm -hmm. 
if you, if you know that, that, by the way, if I make reference to these things and you don't know these, look them up. Make, jot it down. Yeah, and, and spend a little time during the balance of the week right. reading this and having conversations with the Lord. That's right. Because after all, He is the one who teaches. And the Holy Spirit will you know, give you the information I, I, you need. Once again, I will distract myself just a little bit, but I think it's important. Mm -hmm. um, it says, Let not many of you become teachers, for by this you incur a stricter judgment in James. Yes. And I take that responsibility very, very seriously. But the fact of the matter is, the reason for that is I have to be able to say, as Jesus said, my teaching is not my own. Because if my teaching is my own, what I have figured out, what I have derived by leaning on my own understanding, then I have nothing to impart to you. Okay? I have to be passing on to you what I have received from the Lord. Not that you're unable to receive from the Lord, but we all have different ministries. Right. And this is how the body is supposed to function. So, you know, the, the fact is, I, I believe that what I am sharing with you is what the Holy Spirit has given me understanding about. And what you need to do is go have conversations with the Lord and say, well, what, you know, I'm not going to change your culture, but yeah, I feel perfectly comfortable going to the Lord and saying, what's up with this guy? What's the deal here? You know, explain this to me. This is what he said. Is that true or is that not true? The Bereans, after all, did that with the Apostle Paul himself. They tested everything that he said against the Scriptures, against the Word. And there will be times when something is said and, it, yeah. and your spirit will receive it immediately. I mean, it just, it Absolutely. just you just know. The spirit know. bears right. witness it bears to witness it. Witness because to it. it was the spirit who was sent to lead us into all truth. Right. So anyhow. Like I said, if I say during the course of this or other studies, you, you know, I, John chapter 9, and you're not familiar with that, do take some time and go read it. And, because that's the only way you're going to test what I'm saying, by the way. So in John chapter 9, Jesus encounters this man who had been born blind sitting outside the temple. Mm -hmm. and, and if you go read it, you'll see that he healed him, right? Mm -hmm. And the Pharisees were very upset about this, as they were typically upset about the works of Jesus Christ. So in John 9, 16, it says, Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man, talking about Jesus, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. And then later, in the 24th verse of that same chapter, it says, So, they, so a second time they called the man who had been blind, and said to him, Give glory to God, we know, we know this man, again, Jesus, is a sinner. How did they know that Jesus was a sinner? Because they tested him, not against the law, because Jesus came not to break the law, but to fulfill it. And he never, never broke the law. Never. He had no sin, all right? So he was not breaking the law. He was, built, he was breaking their, their tradition that they had built about the law. Okay? How often do we do that? You know, I mean, Alice and I have had been blessed to have the opportunity to travel a good chunk of this world. In, in, all through America. And by the way, there are different cultures in different parts of the United States of America. I mean, we've been all through North America, through Canada, we've been, to, you know, all through Mexico. We lived in Central America down in Belize and ministered all through Central America and, and the Caribbean. And there are so many different cultures. cultures yeah. uh, we've just come back recently. I mean, this, on this trip, we're over in England at the moment, just coming to a conclusion of our eight-month eight trip oh. overseas. And during this time, not only have we been all over England and Wales, but we've had the opportunity to travel through Europe and spend time in Germany. We've just recently returned from a trip to Kenya, East Africa. And we see all these different cultures. cultures and the traditions that they have all come to build. Mm -hmm. Now, oftentimes, I mean, they're, they're going to vary from what from most, our traditions. Yeah, most definitely. That we have learned yeah. not to be troubled by that, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> and and to try and accommodate those differences in them, as long as it doesn't contradict the Word That's of God. Right. Right? That's right. And there's no compromising. No, we, we, we don't compromise about that, and we don't have to compromise. Even if they don't believe exactly the same way we do, I do understand... The foundation of their belief. Yeah, and, and 
uh, gosh. Authority, and I've done a lot of teaching on authority. If you spend any time watching our, our studies, this or our other past studies, authority flows from the top down. Authority, oh, yeah, does, does, yeah, but authority yes. doesn't come from the bottom up, never. No. Nor does authority go sideways. No. It's always from the top mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. That's right? the order that that God. So if, if your parents, for example, and you are training up your child or children in the ways they should go, mm -hmm. obviously, you're shaping and forming, being used by the Lord God, if you're doing this right, mm -hmm. to shape and form their beliefs, yes. which will become, rightly, their traditions exactly. and their culture. We're supposed to have a culture of the Word. Yeah, there is good not, tradition and good culture. Not a culture of the world. Amen. And that's exactly what Paul was talking about a couple of chapters earlier, in chapter 12, mm -hmm. when he said, don't be, don't be conformed to this world. Be but be trans transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. Well, our culture is basically what's that, that tradition has been cultivated in us by the world. It's grown. Yeah. yeah. So, so we need to be prayerful about that and test you know, all of this. We need to, first of all, be testing our own lives. So Paul says, let a man examine himself. Okay? Yes. So, you know, there are cases, like with the parents, where they do have authority. They do have, and that authority in the, in the church doesn't put you in charge because the Holy Spirit is always, always in charge. charge yes. It becomes that responsibility that God has entrusted you with. Right. Steward. You know, this is something I share with pastors a lot. You know, I, I've gone, I just, not long ago, in Manchester, England, I went to a pastor's meeting and I share with them, I, you know, how many of you here trust God? And of course, every hand goes up. And it's good that they trust God. Right. I said, how many of you realize how much God trusts you? And when you stop and think, I mean, that should, that should set you back a minute. Because God has entrusted you, Mr. Pastor, with the care of what is most precious to him, his children, his flock. If your parents, God has entrusted you with the care of of those children. Mm -hmm. He trusts you to do that. You need to be faithful to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's not authority flowing sideways. That is the right authority flowing mm -hmm. from God to you to them, right? Mm -hmm. All right. In verse 5, let me, let's, let's move on. It says, One man regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Mm -hmm. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. Okay? Now, what's he talking about? I, again, I said, you know, a lot of this was probably stimulated in Paul's letter to the Romans by the fact of the cultural differences between the Jewish believers and now the Gentile believers, right? So, I, I certainly don't want to sit in judgment of people's view of, quote-unquote, the day that's being spoken of here. But let's take a look at the Sabbath, for example, right? Uh, most Christians consider, most Christians in the world today, consider Sunday to be the Sabbath. Without a clear understanding, by the way, of how Sunday came to be common for general gatherings. Right, right. That had everything to do with the pagan religions mm -hmm. in Rome, where they worshipped the sun, and therefore people were off from their daily tasks, normal working tasks, mm -hmm. on Sunday. And it was easy for the people to gather. So that, that became a tradition. Not because Sunday was a holier day. Not, 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 because, day not, be, not because Christ was raised on the first no, day. No. But because it was convenient. Okay? Yes. So, the fact is that there are Seventh-day churches. Mm -hmm. there are not just one denomination. There are a few denominations of, of Seventh-day churches. Um, that strongly believe that the Sabbath is Saturday and also strongly judge those who don't agree with them. Yes. All right? That's, that's right. the danger. That's right the there. danger. Now, I, for one, believe that given the fact mm. that God is unchanging, mm -hmm. that's what it says in Numbers 23, 19 and in Hebrews 13, 8, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that God is unchanging and therefore the seventh day is still a Sabbath. Yes. Saturday is still a Sabbath. However, I also believe that our understanding 
of the Sabbath and God's purpose for the Sabbath certainly should have begun to change. Yes. When Jesus said in Mark 2, starting at verse 23, and it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest, and he also gave it to those who were with him. And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. We have to learn then, because if God caused this to be a day of rest, we have to learn how to rest in Him. Amen. I don't judge and condemn those who don't understand this or do this, but I do believe that as a teacher, again, who incurs stricter judgment, I'm called to share the rightly divided word of truth that the Lord has given us. So I'm just using the Sabbath here as an example because it's mentioned, right? Listen to this from Isaiah 58. I'm going to read from I'm going to read verses 13 and 14, Isaiah 58. Okay. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, from speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So let me just ask you a question. And again, I, I don't say this in judgment, but I do. This is the Word of God, yes. which is profitable for, for teaching, profitable for reproof, profitable for correction, and profitable for training in righteousness. What day of the week are, are you supposed to honor? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, way back when... That's, you know, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. If God has made it, I want to tell you something, it's holy. That's right. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what the weather is outside. It matters that God made this day, all right? He is in control. Amen. What day of the week are you supposed to desist from doing your own ways? Well, you know, while Jesus talked about self-denial, not doing your own thing. That's right. That's what day is that? That's every, every day. day. What day are you not supposed to seek your own pleasure? We are supposed to seek and serve the Lord. Not our pleasure, but His good pleasure. That's right. Every day of the week. What day are you not supposed to speak your own word? Well, the Word of God says, Proverbs, you know, lean not on your own understanding. Jesus in John chapter 12 said, He never spoke anything that He didn't hear from the Father. He didn't speak His own Word. He spoke the Father's Word. Every day of the week is a day that you're not supposed to speak your own Word. Peter says that if any man speaks, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. All right? Huh? Every day of the week, it seems to me, is a day that we can rest in the Lord, mm -hmm. be led by the Spirit of God, and we don't have to have that anxiety that comes with saying, figuring out what to do. I was going to just say that there'd be no anxiety then. Because that. He, as it says in Psalm 23, leads us in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's not to be a burden. This Sabbath, and that understanding of the Sabbath, is a relief from trying to figure things out. God will lead us. The Spirit will send to lead us into all truth. Well, just realizing how difficult it is to make decisions. And yeah. when you know that God is the one who is leading and guiding, and He's making, making the decisions. decisions for you. Well, you got to do is follow. Yeah, that's uh, it. That's 
the, the indecision is the, our worst place to be in. Yes. And you may have noticed that the world is filled, the people of the world are filled with indecision. That's right. Okay? If you understand God's leading, you shouldn't have indecision, you should not have indecision in your life. Mm -hmm. Alright? Mm -hmm. If, if you, if you have two paths, you have to believe that he will he will show you the right path right. and lead you in that. That's that is the word of God. So don't be troubled, you know, don't have that indecision in your life. If if you're faced with those choices, seek God right. and seek his leading. Right? Let him make the decision. He is not a God who hides things. God is a God of revelation. That's right. I mean, think about these verses. It says that the Lord roars from Zion. Mm -hmm. It says that wisdom stands in the street and shouts. There is a book of revelation that we have. Not, not a book of hidden. Yeah. All right? God has yeah. promised. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, he's not playing games with us here. Okay? Yeah. So that's just the Sabbath. I mean, mm -hmm. I could mention a lot of other days. I don't know that I want to mention like Christmas Day or... Or yes. Thanksgiving Day, or all the traditions that are built there, and and as Jesus was tested by tradition with the Pharisees, mm -hmm. I, I will tell you that look at those traditions and see if we don't judge other Christians based on those traditions. Okay, hmm. so it, it does this really well when you th if you think about this. And by the way, be a thinking person. Okay. Yeah, be a thinking person. Examine all things and hold fast that which is good. Spend time. David said he meditated on the Word. Get, get to that place where you're thinking about God and the things of God, the Word of God. So, it, it says in, in Colossians 2.16, Paul wrote, Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Don't let people judge you. All right? Because you've got to show yourself approved unto God, as he wrote to Timothy. Not, you don't, right. don't, show you, you don't, don't strive to be approved by men. Work at being approved, or seek being approved by God. Seek the approval of God. Because if he approves of what you're doing, it doesn't matter what a million other people say. It doesn't matter. Because they will not stand and judge you at the final day. That's right. So he says that, but then he continues on to the Colossians. All right, I'm, I'm in the second chapter. That was 2.16. I'm going to read from 17. Talking about the new moon, the festivals, the Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with the using, in accordance to the, with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion, and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. There's a lot of self-made religion around. Mm -hmm. That was true in the time of Babylon, when they were building a tower. That was true in the time of Jesus Christ with the Pharisees and Sadducees. And it's true today, yes. as it was then. You know, Solomon said there is nothing new under the sun, right? That's right. So, now before I go on and talk about this, I want to remind you, and I always like to remind people of what it says. Mm -hmm. Because it says in Psalm 119, verse 165, that those who love thy law shall have great peace and nothing shall offend them. So if, if something I say offends you, 
You just don't love his word enough. <laughs> okay? Take it to the king. Take it to the king. All right. Pride and offense are the roots of the horrible sin of division. We get divided because we think we know better. We think we are better than those other people, those other brothers and sisters who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, just like you and I. Be on guard against pride. Six things, it says in Proverbs 6, six things does the Lord hate, yea, even seven are an abomination. The first one is haughty eyes, because pride is the gateway to all sin. All right. In verse 6, it says, He who observes a day, observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat, and gives thanks to God. Now, there, there is indeed a should be that is implied in Paul's writings, okay? It says again, I'm going to go back to Colossians. In Colossians 3.17 he says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him through giving thanks through him to God the Father. And to the Corinthians he wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, whether you eat or drink whatever you do do all to the glory of God. So there what Paul is talking about there has to be this awareness of the Lord God in our daily lives yes. of all of the things that we do whatever we do we're to do as unto the Lord. Whatever you do so, you know, you don't, you don't put aside God to go to work and be a carpenter or a plumber or a baker or a candlestick maker. You know, we have to do everything. as We have to be conscious of His presence. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So He doesn't just show up with you on, in a church building on a Sunday. No, no. You know, He'll go to work with you on Monday and Tuesday. You need to be conscious of His presence and whatever you do, do as unto Him. I mean, that, that is something that Paul kind of takes for granted here because he's taught it over and over and over. Now, the, the, the apostle, he wrote these words to the believers in Col 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 the, of the Colossians and in in Corinth mm -hmm. to train them in righteousness, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it says in 2 Timothy 3.16. But the obvious fact in all too much practice is that in the church, both of yesterday and today, People do, believers, do many things that, are, that come out of our comforts and traditions. Verses 7 and 8 say this. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. I'm sorry, you're in... 7 and 8. We're, oh, I'm, I'm, back, in, back in Romans. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. You're in Timothy, and I didn't know uh, I'm that. sorry. That's right. Romans 14, uh, verses 7 and 8. Mm -hmm. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So, you're not supposed to live for yourself. You're not even supposed to die for yourself. You don't do anything for yourself. Jesus said, if any man would follow me, he has to deny himself, right? That's right. It's not about us. It's not about us. Okay, so we've got to, everything we do, we belong to him. We've been purchased with a price. That's, that's a hard realization to come from, yes. particularly in this day and age. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said in chapter 2 Timothy 3, he said, for in the last days, perilous times will come. Mm -hmm. And these are those perilous yes, last days, I believe. Really. And the first thing he says is, for men will be lovers of self. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, a, a dis, well, an instinctive reaction, isn't it? When peril comes, that's your first thought is for yourself, your safety. It's always about yourself, yes. Yeah. That's what we have to overcome. That's, that's what self-denial is all about. Yes, that's what the mind of Christ is all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it says in Philippians chapter 2, have the same mind in you. That was in Christ Jesus. Have the same attitude. Yes. Right? He offered himself up. A holy and living sacrifice, as Paul says in Romans 12. Right? He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. Mm -hmm. 
self-denial. We pray a lot of things. You know, we should learn how to pray from Jesus. He taught us how to pray in, in yes, Matthew chapter 5. But he also taught us how to pray when he went and prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. We have to come to that place, that, that place of maturity in our faith, where we can say like Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done. So it says in, in verse 9, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. That's interesting. Well, that is interesting, all right? He's the Lord of the dead and the living. Mm -hmm. You know, in John Milton's most famous work, Paradise Lost, that, you know, I, if you're familiar with that, he wrote that in uh, 1667. So it's probably not in most of your bookstores. No. <laughs> but, it, you know, it, 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 this is a famous writing of Milton. But he has Satan saying, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. I mean, that's a famous line from Paradise Lost. Now, while that may be a great literary moment, it has no point of reality within it. Satan will not reign in hell any more than an inmate serving a life sentence in a maximum security prison is placed in charge of that institution. That's right. Okay? He's not going to reign any place. Satan, as with every created being, human or angelic, even possibly animal, mm -hmm. I'm not throwing that away, right. will bow and confess. Amen. Jesus is the Lord of all, and all will confess that truth through all eternity, as he states a few verses later, and even more specifically, in that letter to the Philippians, when he says, And at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee, shall bow, of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, That's right. and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Satan will bow his knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay? Where is that scripture? Please? Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. However, having said that, we need to consider that Jesus also said, now listen to this now, mm -hmm. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You get that? Yes. He said God. that he is the Lord of the living and the dead. Right. That but this verse says he is not the God of the dead. No. He is the God of the living. That's right. Can he be the Lord of the dead and not the God of the dead? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad you agree. <laughs> <clears throat> when he sent Moses to Egypt to set the Hebrews free, think of this. He said to him, Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. He said to the people, those people that he had chosen calling, he said, I will be your God. He didn't say, I'll be your God and the Egyptians' God. No, no. To the Israelites later on, he said, and this is from Leviticus, in the law, he said, Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. He is not the God of everybody. And this is now, you know, I know this is deep stuff here, right? But think about it. In Jeremiah, the prophets, so the law and the prophets both testified to this, right? In Jeremiah, he said, And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Finally, at the end of the book, right, in Revelation, he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. He who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That's Revelation 21, verses 3 and 7, right? Mm. So the overcomers, the believers, he says, I'll be their, their God. God. But the unbelievers, right. 
They're on their own. <coughs> you see, there, there is, uh, or will be a was. <laughs> yeah. Okay, figure yeah. that one out. There, a God of this world and time for those who are perishing. Yes. His name is Satan. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The word of God, the word of our God, proclaims that Satan is the God of this present world, for the unbelievers. Right. This, I, I, this can be deep stuff, but like I said, think about it, pray about it. People throughout the ages have believed in a multitude of gods, yes. right? And many still do. But in simple point of fact, there are only two. There is one true God, and and there is the... And that's Yahweh. That is Yahweh. The I am that I am. And there is another small g God who is the father of lies who would make himself like the Most High. That's what it says in Isaiah 14, right? 14, 14. Yes. Every so-called God through all time other than our God is the devil in disguise. And he has come, Jesus said, to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10. Yes. All right? It, it doesn't matter how many people have chosen to believe in a false God. There's only one way to a right relationship with the real God. Mm -hmm. You probably Jesus. know this verse, right? John 14, 6. Mm -hmm. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. <clears throat> one way. In the same way that we will dwell with God, as mentioned just above, those who have chosen to follow Satan will follow and dwell with him for all eternity. Yes. Matthew 25, Jesus said, Then he will also say to them, talking about, he will say to him on those, le those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. God didn't make hell as a place that he wanted man to go. Not at all. Not at all. Mm -mm. Hell was a prison built, this eternal prison, for the devil and the, the, the angels who angels. rebelled and followed him. Mm -hmm. But people who are following the devil are... will follow him straight into that prison, and straight into that eternal death. Like the lemmings. Like lemmings. Did you say lemmings? Lemmings. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> I just had a vision of all these little yellow lemons jumping off. Of, oh, that's okay. There is in our time a so-called ecumenical movement. All right, that, that's been afoot for for a long time. Well, let me just go back to the yeah. to uh, speaking about God. So, what people have to be aware of is that a lot of people will come and say, "Oh, I believe in God." And, I, oh, absolutely. You know, and they'll be talking about God, but they're not talking about the God. No, they don't, because they may not even know. Exactly. I mean, the, the Word says that even Satan, he believes in God. That's right. He probably believes in God more than we do, because he's seen him face to face. That's right. We've not, right? He's encountered him personally. Yes. Okay. So he believes. Uh, I believe in Jesus Christ, the gift of the Father, mm -hmm. as my Lord and Savior. And he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Isaac and Jacob. Jacob. Absolute still is. That's right. Still is. God is not a man that he should change, mm -hmm. right? But this this ecumenical movement that seems to be happening around the world, mm -hmm. led by quote unquote Christian yes. churches in many in most instances, it, it would encourage believers, true believers, to believe that we can we can can and should have no. unity with people who either believe in other gods. Or who have believed the false gospel? Right. That that takes me back. Remind, remember, no, but remember what I said in the beginning of this study and the last study. When we're talking about those who are weak in faith, we're talking about people who have that's faith. Right. That's right. Right. Now we're talking about people because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's who they're being led. I am by. going to promise you this, and I say this 
you know, I, I say this in love. Mm. Our God has never said to a Hindu, no. believe in that multitudinous multitude of, of, gods. of gods, deities, and you can have a right relationship with me. No. The Father has never said no. to a Muslim, no. okay, go ahead and believe in Allah and, and His no. Prophet Muhammad, and that will bring you into a right relationship. He's never said that. Mm -hmm. If He has never said it, then nobody has faith, faith in them. That's right. They have that imitation. That's right. Satan is the great imitator. The lie is the imitation. All right. Jesus, that's what I just read from John 14, 6. He is the only way to the Father. All right? And it says, no, I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 17. Mm -hmm. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Oh, yeah. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Now, a really blatant example of this that's going on mm -hmm. uh, would be that of what's called Krizlam. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's an abominable mixing of Christianity and Islam. Yes. <coughs> this move started in Nigeria back in the early 70s, I think. Now, this heresy started, as I said, in the early 70s in Nigeria, and it spread to the United States. And, and reportedly, it's been, in no, it's been accepted mm -hmm. by a lot of notable Christians. Um, now, again, you know, I am going by what I've read in news and, and interviews I've seen. But Rick Warren in Saddleback, um, Robert Schuller in the Crystal Cathedral have become part of this movement. <laughs> Former American president... George W. Bush, who was accepted by many conservative Christians in, in the country mm. as the epitome of having a Christian president, said on an interview, and I heard this interview, mm -hmm. on ABC television with Charles Gibson in, in 2011, yes, right? Yes. He said that Christians and Muslims worship the same God and just arrived there by a different path. That's a quote, right? He also stated in an interview with uh, an Arabian television station, mm. he said, we all came from Abraham, talking about the Christians and the Muslims, Muslims and the Jews, right? Mm. Now, that's a point that he could use a little education on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Training. He's, he, yes, he needs to be educated on this. Because the simple fact of the matter is, while, while Christians of today and the Jews who practice Judaism, yes. share that same root with Abraham, yes. Islam does not. No. That is a, a lie that's being told, right? <coughs> you see, Abram, the Abram and Sarai, they were told by God that they would have a child. A promise. a promise was made that they would have a child from whom all the nations would be blessed. Mm -hmm. When it didn't work out the way they thought it was going to work out, and they got a little impatient, Sarai suggested that Abram have relations with her servant, Hagar, mm -hmm. which took place, and Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. To Ishmael all right? Ishmael was the son, and Ishmael is what Muslims think that's the root of their religion, the Arab nations. And by the way, God said there would always be conflict between right. between, Abr between uh, Ishmael Isaac and, and Isaac, mm -hmm. right? Because Isaac was the son of the promise. Yes. Right? So Abraham gave Abraham and Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Abram, Abram and, and Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. Okay? Abram is not the same man as Abraham. No, not. Abraham was a new creation in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay? He gave birth 
to the son of the promise. And when God called him to that test that resounds through history and said, take your son, your, your only, only son, son Isaac, yes. up the mountain and offer him. That's what he said, your only son. God did not see did not recognize Ishmael, Ishmael as, as the son Israel. of Abraham. That's right. Unfortunately, George Bush didn't get that. He didn't. So he thinks that we're all on the same path and that you can have this merging. Well, the fact of the matter is, that's, not, that's simply not, not true. true. This all goes to the issue that I spoke of earlier, accepting those who are weak in faith. That does not include accepting those with no faith in Jesus. Right. Now, we are indeed to love them. We're indeed to love them enough to declare the truth to them that Jesus is the only way to the Father and to eternal life that He so dearly purchased. Amen. Okay? It's not about hating your enemies. It's about loving your enemies. That's the teaching in righteousness of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. But you've got to love them enough to share the truth. To speak the truth in love is what the Word says. Amen. To let them know that they're on a wrong path. And that path that they're on doesn't lead to a right relationship with God Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, who sent His only begotten Son, that we might, whoever, whosoever, would receive Him and accept that truth, would have eternal life. This is a movement that is not of God. Be on guard against things like that. Because, you know, people, the devil can make it sound very pretty. Yes. He's the father of lies. He's been, he has been telling lies longer than you've been alive. Oh, uh, he's very good at it. He's, he's good at telling lies. He's well practiced at it. That's why you have to test everything against the Word of God. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't trust your own understanding. Tr trust the Word of God. All right? Well, I, I think uh, well, it's, time. Well, we're, it's time. I'm really glad that you could be with us today. And again, I want to I want to remind you that we we welcome and encourage you encourage your, your comments, your questions, your suggestions, just write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, we're, we're really blessed that we have, to, we have the opportunity to share this time with you and to share God's Word with you. Amen. And as we close, I know that Alice wants to remind you that Jesus loves you <coughs> a lot. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Until next time, God bless you and goodbye. Amen.